right, we are back. So let's get into some of these examples here. So first up, <clears throat> let's find the limit as n approaches infinity of n over n plus 1. So this is the example that we've been looking at so far. Um, <clears throat> we looked at the graph and determined that it appeared the sequence was approaching 1, um, but now we can actually verify this. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of n over n plus 1. Okay, we can go ahead and apply some of our algebraic techniques to this. So I can divide top and bottom by n, right? the highest power in the denominator. So that's 1 over n over 1 over n. I haven't changed the identity of the limit at all. But now what this gives us is a new expression, so 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. This term down here is going to head to 0 as n goes towards infinity, right? Because if the denominator is infinitely large, the whole thing is getting closer to 0. So that gives us oops, 1 over 1 plus 0, which of course is just 1. which is exactly what we thought it should be. All right, so we get that value is in fact 1, that sequence converges. <clears throat> Let's look at this next one here. So is the sequence n over the square root of 10 plus n convergent or divergent? So if we take the limit as n approaches infinity of this sequence, And let's go ahead and apply the same trick, right? Because there's nothing that we can really do with this. So we'll do 1 over n over 1 over n, like that. So this gives us limit as n approaches infinity of <clears throat> 1 over square root. Now, just as a side note here, when you're trying to bring in this 1 over n into the square root, like this. Oops. In order to bring it into the square root, you have to have a square root of it. But we can't change what it is, right? We can't just make it a square root without changing it. So we need to go ahead and just square the terms inside. That makes it equivalent. And now this we can bring in and combine with this. Okay, so this is going to give us 10 over n squared plus n over n squared or just 1 over n. So this is going to be 10 over n squared plus, plus 1 over n. <clears throat> okay. And now if we look at the pattern of behavior here, as n goes towards infinity, this term heads to 0, this term heads to 0. So the denominator is all heading towards 0. Now that doesn't mean it's equal to 0, because okay? that would be undefined. But it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, heading towards 0. And with fractions, as the denominator gets smaller and smaller, the value of the fraction actually gets larger and larger. Right? That's the property of the fractions. They are inverses in that way. So we can say that since the denominator is approaching 0, the entire value is approaching infinity. So, is the sequence convergent or divergent? It is divergent. All right. <clears throat> now, you might have been asking yourself this whole time, uh, why do these algebraic limit tricks? Because we have Los Pitals rule. Um, and with this next example, we're going to take a look at that. So it says calculate the lim limit as n approaches infinity of ln of n over n. And this one, we don't have algebraic tricks to help us. We would have to do Los Pitals rule. However, there's a problem. We cannot apply Los Pitals rule. to a sequence. The reason is because Los Bitals rule requires continuity uh, for us to be able to use it. And a sequence does not provide a continuous graph. A sequence is just a bunch of points. 
that I'll give the idea of a picture, right, a pattern, but they are not a continuous function. So we cannot apply Los Pitals rule to a sequence. That's why we haven't been using it. But we can apply it to a corresponding function in terms of the real variable x. <clears throat> so what we can do is rewrite the sequence as a function of x, apply Los Pitals rule to the function, and then go back and say, therefore, the sequence must approach the same value. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So limit as x approaches infinity of ln of x over x. This would give us, right, infinity over infinity, which is indeterminate. So we could apply Los Pitals rule. So that's limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x over 1. Simplify that. Get rid of that denominator entirely. So as x approaches infinity, this is just 1 over x. So as x goes towards infinity, 1 over x heads towards 0. And since the corresponding function in terms of x heads towards 0, we can say thus the limit as n approaches infinity of ln of n over n equals 0. All right, so again, we are allowed to work with these real number functions, um, but not, not applying Los Bitals rule to a sequence. Okay, so there are some properties we just can't apply to sequences. <clears throat> okay, let's look at this next one. So determine whether the sequence negative 1 to the n is convergent or divergent. So let's list out a few terms <clears throat> in this sequence just to get a feel for what's happening here. So when n is 1, we get negative 1 to the first. So that's negative 1. When n is 2, we get negative 1 squared, which is 1. When n is 3, we get negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1. Then we get negative 1 to the fourth, which is 1. <clears throat> and you can see here we're going to get a pattern of repeating values of 1 and negative 1 just forever. So the question about convergence or divergence means does the, does the function approach a specific value? And in this case, because <clears throat> the terms of this sequence oscillate back and forth between negative 1 and 1 infinitely, it's never approaching one specific value. So this tells us that the limit as we head towards infinity would be non-existent okay, or undefined. So the sequence must be divergent. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that out here. So the terms oscillate infinitely between negative 1 and 1. So a sub n doesn't approach any single number. So what that tells us is the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n does not exist. Thus, the sequence negative 1 to the n is divergent okay, because it does not approach that one specific value so it must be divergent <clears throat> okay 
Uh, let's look at this next one. <clears throat> so evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 to the n over n if it exists. Okay, so here's where we're going to start using some of these properties we talked about. So first, and so we don't have to worry about this negative. <clears throat> Let's calculate the limit of the absolute value. Okay, so first, calculate limit of the absolute value. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of negative 1 to the n over n. This is going to give us a better picture of the behavior of the function, kind of ignoring that negative. So this is going to be just the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n. <coughs> So the negative 1 to the n will always be positive, and n is already always positive because right n goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to infinity. And as n approaches infinity, 1 over n approaches 0. And if you look back at the previous page, so the very last uh, theorem or definition that I shared at the end of the last video, it said that if the limit of the absolute value approaches 0, then the limit of the original function must also be zero. So thus, the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 to the n over n is zero. <clears throat> okay. And if you look at the values of this sequence, uh, they are getting closer to zero, but the negative just means they're alternating. So it starts off like up here, then here, then here. Just getting closer and closer, like this, to zero. So it looks something like that. All right, and then if because if you tried to connect it with a smooth curve, it would look something like this. The value is just going back and forth. All right. Let's look at the next one here. So discuss the convergence of the sequence a sub n equals n factorial over n to the n. Okay, this is where n factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have to be careful here because this function, uh, we would like to be able to apply the same technique we did on those last ones using Los Vitales rule. Uh, the problem is that there is no equivalent function for this <coughs> um, in the real variable x because n factorial is only defined for integers, right? You can only have 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial. So um, you can't have it, you know, 1.3 factorial, something like that in between. Um, so we are not able to apply that same technique here. So let me just make a note of that. So... Uh, note, we can't, oops, we can't type. We can't use Los Vitales rule because there is no equivalent function. <coughs> in terms of x, since x factorial only exists for integers. Okay, so we're not going to be able to actually use that same technique in this one. Um, so what we can do is let's just look at the first few terms, right? If you're ever in doubt about a sequence, just look at the first few terms, see if you can pick up on a pattern and get an idea of what's happening. So let's look at the first few. So we have a1, so an n is 1, that is 1 factorial over 1 to the first, so that's just 1. a2, that's 2 factorial over 2 squared, 
So that is 2 times 1 over 2 times 2, okay, which is 1 half. A3, we have 3 factorial over 3 cubed. So this is 3 times 2 times 1 over 3 times 3 times 3, which simplifies to 2 ninths. But if you look at the pattern here, what's happening, we get repeated multiplication in the numerator and in the denominator. The denominator is always the n value, okay, counted n times, and the numerator is always n terms starting at n and then counting down to 1. So let's write, try to write a general term here. So a n, which is n factorial over n to the n, this would be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., etc., all the way down to 3, 2, 1. Okay, multiplying all those terms. In the denominator, we would have n repeated n times. Okay, because that's what the power is, right? It's just repeated multiplication. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this up just slightly. I'm going to pull this last term here out entirely. So this is going to be 1 over n times what's left, which is right 2 times 3 times 4, etc., all the way up to n, over n times n times n, all the way up n times. Okay. Now, with this term, so clearly, clearly this term, we already have worked with that, so we're going to hold off on that for just a second. Let's look at this one. So can everybody see that this term here, it must be at most 1 because the denominator will always be larger than uh, the numerator. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. So notice, let me type this. So notice this is at most 1 since the numerator is always smaller than the denominator. Okay, numerator is always smaller, right? Because we have the same number of terms here, but the ones in the bottom are all n. But the ones in the top, one of them is n, but all the others are smaller than n, right? They're counting up to n. So that means numerator will always be smaller, which means that that term will always be less than or equal to 1. Okay? So since that term will always be less than or equal to 1, we can say that a sub n, which we know must be greater than 0, a sub n must be less than or equal to 1 over n. Okay, so again, try to track with that logic here. If this term is at most 1, then a sub n is at most 1 times this. Right? And that's what we just said here. a sub n is less than or equal to 1 over n times 1. Right? So that's what we have here. Now we know something about the behavior of 1 over n. Right? So we know So we know 1 over n. What does 1 over n approach as n goes towards infinity? Well, we just saw that, right? As n goes towards infinity, 1 over n approaches 0 as n approaches infinity. Thus, the sequence 
a sub n, leaves in space, must approach zero as n approaches infinity. By the squeeze theorem. Oops. Okay. So, again, let me go ahead and just state that one more time. So, <clears throat> a sub n is between 0 and 1 over n. But we know that as n goes towards infinity, 1 over n goes to, to 0, which means a sub n is stuck between 0 and 0, which means by the squeeze theorem, the sequence a sub n must approach 0 as well. Okay, so there we go. We got, using the squeeze theorem, we were able to find the value of that sequence. So it converges to zero. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. <clears throat> so for what values of r is the sequence r to the n convergent? All right, so for this one, we need to look at um, all the possible cases, and we're going to use some familiar information that we already know. Okay, so we already know the behavior of this exponential, right, if we're talking about the corresponding function. Um, so we know, we know that the limit as x approaches infinity of a to the x equals infinity for a greater than 1 and the limit as x approaches infinity of a to the x equals 0 for a between 0 and 1. Okay, so we know these two from our knowledge of exponential functions. Okay, so we already know if we're between 0 and 1, the values will head towards 0 <clears throat> as the power gets larger. And if we are bigger than 1, as the power gets larger, the value just grows infinitely large. Okay? So using uh, a equals r, okay? so we're just going to use r instead of a, it's just a notational thing, gives us this result. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of r to the n equals infinity if r is greater than 1 and 0 if r is between 0 and 1. <clears throat> okay. Now, this doesn't cover everything, right? This, does, this only covers values 0 to 1 and then greater than 1. So a couple of values that we can get fairly quickly. So clearly the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 to the n. So when we're actually at 1, 1 to any power is 1. And the limit as n approaches infinity of 0 to the n 
Well, 0 to any power is just 0. So there's a couple more values that we know already. Okay, so we know that and when we're at 1 and we're at 0, we are convergent to these values. So this has covered all non-negative values, right? We're 0 up through infinity. We're good. Um, now let's talk about what happens when we are negative. So if, let me go ahead and just type this here. So if r is between negative 1 and 1, okay, so if r is between negative 1 and 1, oops, there we go, then this tells us that the absolute value of r must be between 0 and 1, right? Think about it. If r is negative 1 half, the absolute value of r is positive 1 half, which is between 0 and 1. So if r is between negative 1 and 1, uh, or excuse me, why did I say negative 1 and 1? I think I got a little ahead of myself. Negative 1 and 0. That's better. Then the absolute value of r is between 0 and 1. There we go. So, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the limit of, as n approaches infinity, of the absolute value of r to the n, which we can find, uh, we can pull the power out of that absolute value. That's the absolute value of r. to the n, that would be equal to 0. Okay? And that's because this is the same thing as the case that we have uh, right here. Because right? we're between 0 and 1 here. So we would have the same outcome for that absolute value of r. Okay, so that gives us 0. So we can say thus, thus the limit as n approaches infinity of r to the n equals 0 on the interval negative 1 to 0. <clears throat> So that gives us everything now except for what happens if r is less than or equal to negative 1. So we can say, so if, um, let's see, I've run out of room here. Uh, just try to squeeze it in down here. So if r is less than or equal to negative 1, then this is going to tell us the sequence diverges. And the reason for that is actually because we can see in previous examples what happens. So if we go back to the previous page, we look at this example right here, negative 1 to the n, that's precisely this situation. Um, and we saw that that one was divergent, right, because it just kept... Uh, going back and forth, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, etc. And if we have um, a value that's smaller than negative 1, so like negative 2 to the n, then that's just going to become right negative 2, positive 4, negative 8, positive 16. Those values are just going to get larger and further apart, oscillating back and forth between positive and negative. So that tells us that the sequence diverges uh, as seen in our previous example. 
as seen previously. Okay, so kind of to summarize the question here, so for what values is the sequence convergent? Well, it's convergent for any values between 0 and 1, uh, at 1 and at 0, and between negative 1 and 0, but not for anything less than or equal to negative 1 and not anything bigger than 1. So in conclusion, it is convergent on the interval negative 1 less than r less than or equal to 1. That would give us all possible values of r where this sequence is convergent. Okay, and if we look at the top of the next page, that's basically what this is just summing up for us. So the sequence rn, r to the n, is convergent if r is greater than negative 1 and less than or equal to 1, and divergent for all other values of r. All right, so we say the limit is 0 if r is strictly between negative 1 and 1, and it's equal to 1 if r is 1. So those give us all possible convergent values for this sequence. So uh, now let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take our next pause here. Um, we have one more major topic, um, and then a nice, uh, nice kind of proof style example that we're going to.